Well, thank you very much, uh, Edward and Lucas. And um, while we're waiting for questions from people online, I think what I'm going to do is kind of open it up to some people in the room, to maybe those of you who weren't here yesterday, maybe to pose questions. We'll start off with general questions and points of clarification, and then we'll move into more specific questions in a moment. So can I invite people in the room to ask any general questions or points of clarification about what uh, Edward and Lucas have, have said? Any general points that you want to make? Yes, please. So if you have a few. We're just going to pass the mic around to make sure you can hear the question. Um, and oh, could you just say who you are for the... For the I'm from UCL. And in um, Lucas' presentation, could you please explain a bit about your environmental metrics? Because uh, I found the information are quite general. So in terms of um, what's your baseline case, and what's your system boundary, and what's your function doing in your configuration? Because uh, people are familiar with the greenhouse gas, for example, the building. Um, the, the way how you calculate, it depends on how you make assumptions, where you get the come from, and the regional base as well. So from the presentation, it sounds quite general. So you could carry by a bit from the So I think uh, I definitely agree. That was, that's been one of the limitations of this area is that um, each study, uh, or the mix of studies is quite um, heterogeneous. It's, each study has relatively different system boundaries, looking at different countries, looking at uh, different baseline diets. Um, so what we wanted to do is really just cut across that and take an average across all studies that looked at, at a vegan diet. Um, I think using the relative uh, measures, kind of, instead of absolute measures, um, kind of sidestep some of the issues of differences in system boundaries between some of the studies. Um, yeah. yeah. I, I, have done, I have done quite a lot of um, study in this area, and I know that I have compared um, some case published in this area. I know, not not particular from the system, but the member in this area. Yeah. And when you compare in different studies, you know, they have different system boundaries. The number of difference is huge. So I think here you have to be quite careful about to combine the general information together with someone much about what is the system boundary and what is the assumption course in the lab. Because that sometimes the results could be quite misleading. Mm -hmm. So without lab, you so have to be quite careful on that. Because and the other thing is the system boundary that you are including about, so if you're just looking at a food production system, or do you also looking at, for example, food distribution, um, food uh, cooking as well? And there's another issue in here that um, it's on food waste that I'm not sure if you can see it as well. And food waste is a big issue mm -hmm. in the food systems. Uh, one third of food produced uh, end up in the field. And so, how 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 do you think to account that? So, yeah, I, I agree. Food waste is a, it's a huge issue, um, but it's a kind of a different pathway. So, this looked at specifically at how consumers choose what they eat. Um, but if, for example, <coughs> okay. So, for example, um, if you are suggesting people to go for vegan diet rather than meat diet, but if yeah, it could be that has we didn't look at that and just from my uh, understanding of the field, we haven't seen a lot of comparisons of how different diets uh, compare on, on food wastage. So I mean just just to clarify this of course was a systematic view of existing evidence. So it shows that there's a lot of gaps in that evidence. And one of the uh, interesting things is that the limited number of environmental variables that people actually measured. So there are very few uh, studies on biodiversity loss or nitrogen and phosphorus loading, for example. And as you've shown us, quite small numbers on even water use. Yes. So thank you very much. I'm Sanada Dango from the London School.
And I think one of the really nutty areas here is going to be how to combine the various indicators of sustainability. Um, and I think this is a, a, it's going to be an enormous challenge when you think about multiple different ways in which you can measure sustainability, whether it's pollinator loss or greenhouse gas emissions. And when you, uh, you know, in the, in the combination, whether you decide they're all equally weighted or whether you think that there's some more important than others and how those decisions are made. And of course, when you're thinking in um, Edward was talking about uh, context, you know, those, those weightings are going to differ in different contexts. And I think that that's part of the fascination of this work that's going to open up these, this really quite nuanced, a new and much more. I mean, at the moment, the methods we've got are very simple and really quite mono-focused uh, and, and are unable to answer the big questions because they're far too simple. Of course, at the other end, you will have a metric or a method of measuring something which is so specific to the field in which you're growing something that it's not particularly useful either. So it will be, I think, will be one of those one of those things that the group will need to that this work will help inform is what are the various metrics, what are the various measures you might make when you're thinking about the same diets, how might you combine them, and at what level do you contextualize? I just wanted to say, I mean, I think this is a really great start, but I think those are the sorts of things that I would write up in there, the priority areas. So what are the, what are the measures you're interested in? How do you combine them? And at what level do you, do you, uh, do you contextualize your measure? So I hope, um, I know that there's some people having problems hearing people on the microphone. Um, so maybe in responding, you can sort of repeat some of the, the points that Alan was making. Who would like to respond to that? Um, let me... Uh, Alfie, could you come up here? Because I think the, it's easier for people to hear if you come to this mic. That may not work. Hello, so I'm Alfie Gaithan Hardy from the Oxford India Centre. And just building on what Alan said, which was the point about how do we weigh and combine different metrics, I think one thing to add to that is who are the metrics for? And so if we're talking about academics, then we might have the time and the luxury to consider a wide range of, of different metrics. But from my experience in policy, people much prefer a, a single number or a very small um, number. So we have to be careful about who we're designing the metrics for as well as how we're designing them. OK, any other responses to that particular point? Obviously, Alan, we might come back to this um, during the course of the discussion when we get into the more uh, specific um, areas. So any other general comments like that? I mean, waste was an issue that we didn't discuss very much yesterday, that the working group didn't discuss very much. Whether we should include within this work some metric around waste or whether it actually can be embedded or encapsulated in some of the other indicators, but making sure that you actually do account for the, for the total emissions, say, or the total um, water use, but I'd be interested in uh, comments about that around the table. Tara, do you want to just come in? Is Tara Garnett's going to speak. Sorry, well, uh, Tara Garnett. When, when it comes to waste, I think there's an, a difference between avoidable and unavoidable waste. And when we're talking about unavoidable waste that's somehow inherent in the the product in question, like a banana skin, then then you have to factor that in and maybe also look at uh, possible uses for that waste that you, you could do something with. When it comes to avoidable waste, which is to do with um, cultural preferences and all the rest of it, then I think that underlines the importance of looking at all the multiple dimensions of sustainability, including the sort of socio cultural ones and 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 that's when you get back to Alan's point about how do you what do you do with those indicators when you, when it comes to prioritizing and, and forming policy decisions as well as bearing in mind how how things like cultural preferences actually change over time so there needs to be a method of documenting changes over time um, as social and other norms change. I think one of the issues that's coming up very early on is who's going to use these metrics and also the balance between the global and the local or the national. Um, and because there will be different factors at play on these different scales. 
So on a global level, one obviously wants to look at the overall kind of sustainability of a diet for a population of perhaps you know, nine or ten billion towards the end of the century. But at the national level or the local level, um, as we've heard, there might be big, very big disparities in things like water availability, for example, which would um, really influence the, the metrics. So that needs to be taken into account. So any other general comments? Or do you, Edward, do you want to come back on any? Oh, yes, please. You might need to come up here, actually, because I think they're having trouble with the mic. Yes. Well, do you want to try it, and then we'll see if the... It's, people are saying it's better if the, the question is asked from here. If you don't mind, unless it's handy, you want to repeat. Oh, it's easier if people come and ask their questions from here. Okay. You'll just hear a slight gap between questions, because we were asking people to come up to the main mic. Hi, so this is Andy Whitmore from Rothamsted. Um, you've assembled a, a really interesting set of data here, and it's fascinating to hear the story. Um, just looking at those metrics, I wonder how much data you have or whether you consider the variation and the variability that's associated with them. And I ask this for a number of reasons, one of which, of course, is the obvious confidence that you might have in, in those metrics and, and in their use. But a subtler, longer time or, or, or bigger question, really, would be the use you might put to that knowledge about the variability, that the climate change people um, do a lot of work on attribution in order to try and develop evidence for policymakers that there actually is a signal in, in climate change and, and, and the consequences and what it's causing. And I think in, in terms of this very large field of diets and sustainability and health, to be able to show an attribution towards an improvement in diet in health and an improvement in environmental quality would actually be very useful. And I think it's understanding the variability in, in the kind of metrics and data and things that you're, you're uncovering would be very useful in, in the sort of mathematical methods that, that I'm familiar with um, for, 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 for showing that to policymakers, providing that evidence and confidence. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so that's a very, very important. That's a very important point, and I think there were, or there are quite serious limitations in the literature that um, Lucas un un uncovered. And one of the issues, of course, is around life cycle analysis and how it often doesn't include measure measures of variability. So you come up with a single figure um, for you know the environmental footprint of a particular food group or whatever. So that clearly needs um, addressing. I think if you if you're going to take into account the point or respond to the point that you, you've made. Does anyone, Lucas, do you want to respond to that or does anyone else want to respond to these kind of issues? Anyone who's done perhaps more work on life cycle analysis like to respond? Yes, so would you mind coming up to just be a couple of seconds before you get a response. Yeah. Hi, I'm Aidan Boyong from UCL. Um, so for, from life cycle um, assessment point of view, um, it's not, it sometimes depends on who your audience are. Um, for example, you and your audience are the public or policy makers, sometimes you quite come to put uh, everything into one single number, um, which sometimes could be quite subjective because of the looks of assumption goes into law. However, there's, um, the ISO actually do not recommend to do that, so it's much better if you can have your number layout in terms of um, how you, in terms of the catalyzation without not going into a single number. And that probably would give you much more information on where the impact comes from, and you can also have a kind of much better idea what the different impact might be and, and how that how long I can go back to your food system to see why improvement might be made. So that's kind of um, approach that I would say. So, so I think I was think I would say kind of looking at different numbers before you actually go into a single number if you if that's absolutely needed. Otherwise, yeah, sometimes result could be quite misleading. Thank you. So. Okay, so I think we're getting some questions now coming through from the people on the webinar. So I think we will, um, Anna, could you maybe read out the next question? Yeah, so that there are quite a few questions and comments from the remote audience. So I think what um, is really a question of clarification is um, around production systems. So um, Robin Alders from University of Sydney, who is a vet, is asking, um, 
what uh, which production system was used to produce the remnant wheat. I think that refers to uh, Lucas's presentation. So that raises a point that um, greenhouse gas emissions will vary um, from production system to production system. And then the same point is made by Station Nordin University of Illinois, based in Malawi, um, that surely the way in which meat is produced can be sustainable or not, and the same uh, goes for vegetarian diets. So that's perhaps a point of clarification. And then a, a few other people raised uh, issues such as... Should, should um, we take that yeah, one, we take first, this one? Okay. first of all? Yeah. Um, the issue about meat, um, sustainable meat production and different environmental footprints from different um, approaches to um, the meat production. So, Lucas, would you like to different food systems? Yeah, so again, I think that's one of the limitations. Um, the underlying data that, the, that all the studies were reviewed used I think generally is kind of average impact of um, production systems. Um, so it's possible that comparing different farms you get vastly different impacts from beef production. Um, but I think averaging across the system um, and the systems that provide most of the food that population eat, um, I think looking at those relative differences is still uh, illustrative of, of the impacts of different food types. But I think uh, these questions raise an important point about uh, having a better database of how environmental footprints would vary according uh, to the production system used. And I think it uh, illustrates the, the gap in, in current knowledge, particularly in people doing systematic reviews of uh, sustainable diets. So I'm going to hand over to uh, Ellen now. I think she's going to make a comment on this. Yeah, I just want to... Yeah, ex excuse me. Elin Röss, Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences. Just want to uh, give a comment on, on the distinction here between consumption and production and what uh, we're looking at doing in the working group. We're at an initial stage, so we welcome all feedback on this, but we're thinking here of, of focusing on the sustainable diet as a functional unit. Uh, and uh, that would bring some novelty to this field because there's quite a lot of research on sustainable agriculture, uh, food products, using life cycle assessment, but what we try to do here is to, to use the, this, the diet as the functional unit. So, so we, had, we struggled a bit yesterday, but we're, we're getting closer on, on trying to focus on the sustainable diet. and, and, and try to find out what are useful metrics for the diet. Um, so, um, and what we also want to do is to provide some kind of checklist when you're uh, designing these sustainable diets because um, as you heard before, most research so far has focused on nutrition and environmental issues. So what we want to do here is to bring in the socio-economic aspects, cultural aspects as well and provide some kind of a checklist for policymakers, researchers to include all these things uh, in the concept of a sustainable diet. And then there's uh, some huge challenges uh, when it comes to how to measure some of these things. But just to have them up on the table we think is valuable. Thank you very much. Um, just to um, respond to a few of the other um, questions that are coming through. There's one about use of GMOs and just want to clarify what this session is about. We're, we're not making judgments in this session about you know, whether GMOs or any other approach is, is a good way forward or not. We're trying to devise metrics by, by which one might assess the sustainability of, of diets. Um, then there's a question about food processing and saying that the analysis that was presented doesn't sufficiently address the issue of food processing and I think some of that just reflects the gaps in the literature. I mean, all, all this study was doing was exposing what the literature shows us at the moment. And what you can see is that there's enormous gaps in the literature um, and also considerable methodological weaknesses. But Lucas, do you want to say anything more about that? Yeah, again, so this, this looked at mostly of, you know, the mix of, of foods that we choose to consume um, rather than the methods of whether it's processed or un unprocessed. Um, but, yeah, these issues of processing did come up in the literature. Um, they're still quite limited, the, the studies looking at this, but 
generally what we found too is that there's trade-offs in terms of, um, you know, one would assume that processing would add uh, additional stages of, of manufacturing of inputs and therefore higher uh, environmental impacts. But some of these studies also pointed out that there's economies of scale that when you process, you also reduce waste, uh, you incre increase longevity, um, and processing industries also tend to be more efficient. Um, so rather than kind of comparing local unprocessed food and kind of uh, mass consumed processed food, uh, there weren't that huge of differences between the two. There's kind of trade-offs between, um, between these two routes. Okay, now some other uh, general questions more uh, about issues, important issues about social protection programs, whether they uh, would be included in these kind of metrics, and I think we'll come on to that uh, later on when we, as we go through the specific uh, domains. The impact of different diets on soil security, um, and I think again there was very little evidence from the research literature linking, um, which actually took into account the impact of different diets on soil loss or soil degradation. So again, that seems to be reflect a, a genuine gap in the in the literature, but I think it's something that um, we discussed briefly yesterday about whether that should be a metric, um, and perhaps we'll we'll come on to that in a moment as well. And then there's another question about the food industry, which um, uh, you know industrial domination of agricultural production. Again, I think that would come into some of the cultural, sort of ethical governance issues around around the food system and, and around sustainable diets. So we'll come on to that later. Maybe we'll now start to focus in on some of the more specific questions that we want your Answers to, or Jenny, do you want to? Do you want to come in on? Oh, Jenny McDermott's going to come in on one particular point, and then we go. I'm going to sort of start asking people more specifically about uh, their views. Okay, uh, this is Jenny McDermott. I just wanted to really follow up on a couple of points that have been made, particularly one point by Alan um, about what should we prioritise, what's important, and I think we've got to be really careful. We aren't driven by what data is available. We've done a lot of work on greenhouse gas emissions because there's potentially a little bit more data mm -hmm. available on that. But I think we also need to not be driven by the fact that we've got data on that and we don't have anything on soil, that that then becomes a priority. Um, and also part of this working group was really to identify where the gaps are in research, where we don't have data, and perhaps where that should be driven. So I think when we go through each of them, there's obviously a lot more work on greenhouse gases. There's probably a lot more work on nutrition related to food than on a lot of the other elements, but we've got to actually think what do we need to know for a sustainable diet, not just what drives us in terms of data. Yeah, that's, that's a really important uh, point, and I think it's one that we're, we'll sort of get on to now. So maybe I can move the discussion along into um, the environmental domain. And obviously a whole range of metrics could be used to quantify environmental impacts of diets. We've already heard from Lucas that uh, the current research is quite limited in that respect. So it would be useful to get from people in the room and also those of you um, in the webinar, your views of what, what are the key environmental metrics that should be measured. And I suppose we'll need to distinguish here between the environmental impacts of diets, whether it be greenhouse gas emissions or water use, land use, and then the impacts of environmental change on diets and therefore on nutrition and food availability and so on. So there are two, I think, different sets of problems, which need different sets of metrics. So let's think, first of all, or get your views, first of all, on what metrics can be used, most usefully used, um, to measure the environmental impacts of diets. We've talked about greenhouse gas emissions. Not sure how much more we need to say about those, except to say that um, we tended to use, most investigators use CO2 equivalents, and they just combine all the greenhouse gases together. And I think the recent thinking is that, particularly for some of the very short-lived pollutants like black carbon, which only stays in the atmosphere for a few days, to combine black carbon with carbon dioxide, 20% of which may be in the atmosphere in a thousand years' time, and have a single metric doesn't really make sense. So it may work for perhaps for methane and CO2, but some of these very, very short-lived pollutants one probably needs to consider separately. So that would be a sort of caveat that I would uh, make to that. But I wonder if there are any other comments about what are the really crucial environmental metrics to use, and maybe in what circumstances, because some might be really important in certain regions, but not so important in others. Some are globally applicable, 
and some are really much more locally or nationally applicable. So comments and views would be really useful. So if you could come up to the mic, I think people, and I will also hopefully get some response from people on the webinar as well with uh, their views. I'll try to report on those in just a minute. Carol Daling from the LSE. Um, my comment is about, so you said we, don't, we want to move on from the GHGs, but I just have one comment to add is um, if you think, depending on where you're looking at diets, for example, in the UK, a lot of it is imported from other places, um, but not just in the UK, in many countries. And so when you consider that, you need to look at transportation emissions. Sure. So that's really, sometimes it overcomes the differences uh, from you avoid emissions by importing from a more uh, less carbon intensive place where you can lose that benefit from all the emissions in the transportation. Um, then for the water uh, aspect, I guess, which I'm more familiar with, um, you need to look at, as was mentioned in the presentation, that was a very good point about the local and temporal changes in water stress, um, but also distinguishing between uh, different what type of water sources. So we you know the blue and green water, but also in the blue water, um, looking at rivers, looking at groundwater, non-renewable groundwater, and there's a lot of work ongoing on trying to quantify non-renewable groundwater use for food production. I'm involved in, in some ways. So I think that's, that's really a key. Uh, type of measures and what we are missing, at least from what I could find in the quite quick literature review, is for um, the, uh, the pollution part, so for example with nutrient uh, and NP leakage, there is not contextualization at all. And those impacts are very different depending on the landscape you are working in. So I think there's a lot of work to be done in that area. And how important would you say that is? Is that something that you would, you know, you would raise to a big priority or high priority? Well, I think that's really depending on the context. In some, uh, like you would think, the Mississippi River, mm. that's a big issue. Uh, nitrogen in the, you know, that goes down all the way to the Mexican uh, Gulf. But yeah, so I, I can't tell you the <laughs> straight answer. For that. But I think one of the implications of what people are saying, one of the implications of what people are saying, is that one needs to think about sort of core variables that we would want to measure almost everywhere, and then others that might be very important more locally, but may not be important or not so relevant at a global level. Wouldn't make a lot of sense to aggregate at a global level. Um, Edward, do you want to come and respond to that point? Just quickly, just quickly to come in in a in a, in a response to, to Carol's point there on water footprints, which is something that's incredibly important there. What is the source of the water? Is it, um, has it come from rainfall, uh, surface water, groundwater, and is, is, it, is the extraction rate of the groundwater, <coughs> excuse me, is the extra extraction rate of the groundwater at a renewable rate? I think one of the important things to remember is a lot of the work on water footprints, and I'm just taking this as an example, it might apply to other metrics as well. A lot of the work on water footprints was done not with the aim in mind of quantifying sustainable diets. And so we've got to be very careful about when we use a metric that was done to do something else and apply it immediately across to sustainable diets um, and quantify sustainable diets, that we might not be capturing some of the important elements there. So yes, we have blue, green, and gray water footprints, and we need to distinguish between them. But then when we come to sustainable diets, we're going to have to contextualize that to water availability, water scarcity. Um, and then we're also going to have to look at, for example, uh, virtual water flows as, as food is traded over, over long distances. So, thanks. Yeah, I think the other point came up briefly yesterday was about salination. And, you know, in some cases, uh, irrigation, for example, is excessive irrigation is resulting in salination, which can also result from other factors as well. So that can be locally quite important. So please. Hi. So, um, Adam Boyong from UC again. So, um, my comment on the metrics is that, um, well, one hand we recognize that we need more food because we need to feed 
going to duration. The other thing we also need to recognize is that we actually have a very limited amount of resource. So in terms of how much resource we put into the system to produce the food we want, it's also a very important thing to looking at as well. So not just water, um, for example, mineral. In the last few decades, we have a massive increase our food production, but that's as a um, because we input so much resource like pesticides, um, fertilizers. So we also think about it's not, the sustainable diet is not just about greenhouse gas. It's also about we need to try to um, increase the yield but reduce the amount of resource we put in as well. Mm -hmm. And that looking beyond just beyond water, um, looking at mineral, fossil energy, um, chemicals as well. Um, and the other thing is on the pollution side, we also know that the um, agricultural system has a very big in, um, impact on water eutrophication and chemicals, uh, kind of toxic chemicals in the, in the environment, which can also impact on the health as well. So there are different things that we need to take, in those, take into account. Now, of course, depends on where you are, depends on the region, countries, the impacts will be very different. So that's why we also need to look at kind of quite region or country specific data rather than generalize the whole thing into one single data. Because one the small diet in the UK probably is very different from, from India. And food growing in the UK, some food probably need more energy, but because it can be different in India, probably need less energy. So we need to think about all those issues, not just put them, um, generalize everything. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. I suppose one of the challenges is how to develop metrics um, that reflect that. So you, you mentioned pesticide use, you know, how do we develop metrics that would reflect pesticide use, because pesticides are quite diverse as well. Um, so having a single metric wouldn't be very helpful. So what sort of metrics would one use to measure whether, say, the excess uh, pesticides were being used excessively um, or not? And that, I think that's an important challenge. I don't know if anyone's got a, an answer to that. I think nitrogen and phosphorus loading, one can use things like, I guess, eutrophication. That's not an area I do any work in, but uh, I mean, Andy, you may have views about that. But it would be useful to get any suggestions about some of these kind of um, issues. And also the overall issue of um, inputs versus outputs and the efficiency with which we're using resources. We did discuss this very briefly yesterday, but I don't think we came up with very clear guidelines about how one would look at efficiency, because it's quite a complex area, and there will be efficiency of use of different kinds of resources. So again, is it possible to develop metrics which would be robust and simple and easy to understand? Um, open question, I think. Anyway, useful points. Um, so any other points around um, so env environmental uh, metrics? Are there any other points or suggestions about uh, additional environmental metrics that should be used. Alan. Thanks. Thanks very much. I mean, I think uh, this discussion has been very interesting because what it's really demonstrated is quite how complicated this can become very quickly. And I think, therefore, we do need to think about what's this for and what's the work of the sustainable diet group, what's it for. And it seems to me that there might be two primary objectives. One is to identify a core set of measures that the Sustainable Diets Group thinks are the most important for uh, assessing the sustainability of a diet or the environmental impact of a diet. Of course, how we define that core set is itself an enormous piece of work. And it seems to me that that's l likely to be led at the moment by availability of data. And that's not the ideal way. but for example, if you draw a conceptual framework thinking of all of the impacts of the diet on the environment, then you would have to identify the, the most important pathways from the diet to the environment. And how do you decide on importance uh, in the absence of evidence, in the absence of data? So it's largely likely to be driven by data availability. But that should not mean that it misses out if the expert panel believes that there are some critical pathways which are very, very important linking diets to the environment, then, and there, but there's no data to support that, only preliminary data or a hunch, then that should be identified as this is an important measure, but we don't have any data to support it at the moment, but it should be a priority area for research. 
I think the other purpose of the sustainable diet metric is exactly this. These many points about the various things that could be done uh, if only there was time and money and effort and availability of people to do the research. And I think identifying a list of other influences of the diet on the environment uh, and some thinking about why those influences are important and how they could be measured in which contexts. I think that would be a hugely useful asset for researchers when you talk about one of the uh, one of the purposes of the sustainable group, is, sustainable diet group, is to think about opportunities for research and gaps in the evidence base. Then providing a list with some thought around the multiple different set of uh, things that could potentially be measured, I think would be a very very useful resource. So I think there are two things, and one is a core based on a conceptual framework that identifies key pathways and major evidence where there is evidence um, and also where there isn't any evidence, and then a longer list of these really important areas which researchers on uh, uh, you know comments that are coming through from mm -hmm. from uh, meetings like this, uh, researchers you know need to do more work to see you know the importance of that uh, uh, for the environment. Anyway, thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Very helpful, I think, summary of, of, the, of the issues. Um, I mean, one of the things that comes out of your uh, remarks is the need for prioritization and these core, these key pathways that would um, uh, be relevant to identification of the core variables. And I suppose the question is, what key pathways between what and what? Um, and is it, so it, on the one hand, it might be, um, environmental factors which are going to have a critical impact on food availability or quality for a substantial proportion of the world's population or a national population if you're looking at it from a national perspective. Um, and then also uh, perhaps key pathways by which the food system itself is having an impact on crucial environmental uh, factors which are deemed to be highly important. Um, and that could be around local ecosystems, for example, the destruction of a vital ecosystem, like say mangroves or something that provide all sorts of uh, benefits. Um, it could be irreversibility, so things like soil loss, for example, as I understand it, you know, soil, correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, you can't replenish soil once it's lost um, within kind of human timescales. Depletion of aquifers, which can't be again replenished on human timescales. That, to my mind, would be absolutely, these would be the sort of criteria that one might look at. Magnitude, irreversibility um, would be key, I would think, key criteria that one would use. And also the certainty, uh, the strength of the evidence that links one uh, with variable with another. Perhaps. So these might be the kind of criteria that one would start to use to decide. So, Nita. So, um Following on, I was just wondering, since our discuss discussion yesterday and uh, the comments by Alan, are there conceptual frameworks or is there one framework that is that is out there that people use on sustainable diets? And if not, is this something we should think about to help us figure out how, about these pathways and how they are linked? And uh, I know that there was some discussion with, within the working group about uh, conceptual frameworks and there was some back and forth on that and um, and some people feel like there are too many I don't mean the working group in general um, that you know is there an appetite for another framework if one doesn't exist and is that something we should consider or not uh, so just putting it out there. okay that, yeah. that's helpful um, anyone in the room an expert or knows about these frameworks or so we might also ask our colleagues in the webinar to email in if they've got suggestions around that, but I agree it's an important um, resource to develop if it's not already um, available. So any other, yes, I want to? Okay. I'm going, yeah, so any other comments on environmental um, variables or metrics that we should be measuring before we move on? Um, so just a quick comment about the framework. So um, one of the possible framework, not just for environment, but for agricultural systems, looking at kind of ecosystem service approach. So that's one of the framework that's coming out. So agriculture and to serve food systems to serve as a 
and for many purpose, environment, economic, and cultural, social area. So that's one of the framework potential can look at. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But that probably just leads me to kind of food system. And when you want to extend to a diet, probably you need to look at kind of household, how people, the consumer um, side as well. Because the core system, so I think that's looking at um, um, production systems, that how you serve, as how you should serve in different aspects. No, but that's something probably you can look at, look into. It would be quite, probably would be quite useful to look at that. Yes, I mean perhaps that's something we can talk to you about uh, off, sort of offline, if you like, because it does sound um, very important. So, so just to sort of summarise, where the working group, some of the key um, indicators of the or metrics or groups of metrics that the working group identified, we talked about greenhouse gas emissions. Um, Land use, uh, land requirements, um, water management, we've talked a bit about that, water footprint, virtual water trade, and we've talked about the depletion of um, aquifers. Biodiversity, I think none of us are experts on biodiversity, but um, clearly a lot of work done on biodiversity. Um, and uh, developing simple indicators around that, I guess, is difficult, but of course there are the Aichi biodiversity targets, which are internationally recognized, and we probably need to look at those to see which ones of those could be um, particularly relevant to sustainable diets. The nutrient cycle, we've talked a bit about the nitrogen and phosphorus loading of ecosystems, both terrestrial and aquatic, um, both of those important. In some, again, this is quite local, so this is difficult to do on a global scale, but can be regionally and locally are very important. We've talked a bit about chemical pollution, the question then is which particular, if you think that's important, which it probably is locally, um, which pollutants would you measure, would you prioritize? Air pollution we haven't said much about, but it can be important. I mean, landscape fires, uh, landscape fires are responsible for about 300,000 deaths a year, so from the air pollution from them. And again, in parts of the world, like Indonesia, for example, you know, where we see land clearing, that can be quite a major public health hazard, sort of locally, but also regionally, because you get transboundary air pollution as well. So that can be very important, and it's also a driver of biodiversity loss. So um, I, I think landscape fires could be quite important, and they are possible to monitor, uh, so you can get data on them from, from satellite images and so on. We talked, uh, we, we we did cover marine ecosystems a bit. We didn't discuss them in detail, but as we know, about 90% of fisheries are exploited at their maximum, or in some cases even over the maximum. And most of the increase in fish production has occurred because of aquaculture. Much of that aquaculture is not sustainable. It's not as important as terrestrial ecosystems, but it does provide, you know, um, I think it's about 20% of protein for over 2 billion people. So it's not in insignificant, it's substantial, and in some populations very, very important. So um, fisheries and um, marine ecosystems can be important. And then measures of um, efficiency of use, we again briefly talked about those, but should we be thinking about metrics around, I don't know, kilocalories per land area, but presumably you'd have to adjust that for, for soil type, I don't know, you might want to comment on that. And, if, um, um, and uh, soil fertility, um, organic matter content, and, and so on, plant available mineral content, is that relevant or not? I mean, this is where we probably need expertise of other people in the room, but does anyone want to comment on that? Which ones of those are important and measurable, if any? Or is that something we should? <laughs> or is that something we should just put to one side? Um, hello, Andy Whitmore here again from Boston. Said I'm probably going to end up making a slightly different comment from the one you're expecting, but but. There are numbers for, for a number of the, 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 for these things that, that you want. There are a lot of them may be guesses, but a lot of them are probably derived from models, process models, mm -hmm. and I'm beginning to wonder whether you need to go down that line to some extent in order to generate, um, Alan, Alan's talked about sort of gap filling here, mm -hmm. but, but if, if I don't know a number, um, I would probably go to a model to try if it's based on the underlying processes to try and help guide my thinking as to, as to what needs to go in. But the, the, the slightly different point I wanted to make, and again, I, I have tremendous admiration for the huge amount of work you've done and are trying to do here, 
but I, I would advise against getting too hung up on particular numbers. Mm. Remember, there are going to be marginal changes here. So if we do improve diets by 50%, um, the next 50% of improvement, I'm sorry to say it, but it may not be quite so important. There may be other things. And if an environmental parameter is degraded as a result of this, maybe then there needs to be some pressure to reduce soil degradation or, or something if there isn't a win-win situation, which of course would be desirable. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I'm, what I'm saying really is that metrics that you've come up here may change as soon as you start implementing some of the, the, the strategies that you're thinking of. And um, I, I think the other thing that you mentioned too was, was resilience, which is not a static thing. No. It's something about change. It, it really it implies that you're looking at the change and how things are altered as a result of anything you do to the system. So these numbers are great, fantastic, but I wonder whether there might be a, a role for models to try and, as far as possible, interpolate within regions but where you need to extrapolate in order to understand how, how systems might be changing. That might help us to understand which, which variables are really important. Yes, yes. I, I, that's I, yeah, yeah that's okay, that, that's useful. So uh, I think we could flag up the importance of process based modeling in trying to help understand these linkages better and the relative importance of them. And I, I also take your point about resilience as well. Um, it's something we did touch on yesterday a bit. I think because for the reasons that you outlined, um, it is difficult to come up with metrics of resilience because you know, it, it does depend um, very much on the interplay of a, a number of different factors. And maybe we didn't spend enough time talking about vulnerability enough because vulnerability to um, uh, and dietary change or to nutritional uh, change is, is perhaps easier to assess. I don't know what you think, Alan, but are there metrics of vulnerability to uh, dietary change? For example, you know, we know stunting is higher in rural African populations than urban populations. So we know some of the risk factors for vulnerability to undernutrition. But how good are there, are there good uh, school risk factor schools? Are there good metrics that will help us to understand vulnerability better? Well, you don't have to respond if you don't, if it, no. or maybe I'll listen. <laughs> no, I've done all um, you know, we have a plethora of ways of measuring things in nutrition. Um, I'm not quite sure what they all do, though. Um, so stunting, as you mentioned, is something to do with diet, but something to do with environment in, in the sense of infectious disease, low diarrhea, you know, wash, water sanitation. Those, you know, who knows really? Zinc deficiency it could be anything. So um, it's a final common pathway. Yeah, it's, a, yeah, it's an end point to a multiple, a multiple, uh, uh, and multiple impacts from you know over generations as well. So it's really not really it's not that specific. Um, I, I do think, um, you know, as this becomes more and more complex, again, I, I would make a call for, you know, we need, we need, we need some, some simplicity, otherwise this work's never going to end. And I think, you know, as I mentioned before, a core and then a wider list. But then also we need to think about users. I think it's what Alfie was saying earlier as well, you know, who is this for? And you can imagine one set of users in, in, in countries where there is a lot of processed food with packaged labels on them, and you can put some number on the side of that package, for example, which says this is this or this is that with regards to sustainability. But you can, you can in another setting, actually sustainability of the diet is the last thing people are worried about, and they're just worried about getting enough nutrients and energy into the diet of children, for example. And so are you going to use this metric there, and what would it be used for? So I think you know I think there's a there's a there's a need to think about in what circumstances and, and under what sort of governance jurisdiction type issues are you going to use these things? And and so I think there is a there is a you know there's a need there's a need to develop a, a much more sensible approach and more nuanced approach to thinking about what we mean about sustainability of diets. That is necessary. Uh, uh, and that will be hugely useful you know, in the UK and you know, in a lot of countries where, where that sort of information is needed. I think there's a research question, which I think is largely, likely largely to stay in the academic literature for now, about using this in other contexts where it's just not a priority. 
but it would still be jolly useful as those food systems change in different countries to think about the influence of those food system changes, not just on nutrition outcomes, but also on wider environmental outcomes. So. Now the, the important point, but I would like to just respond to your, your point about that in some countries sustainability is not an issue. What may not be an issue is the environmental impact of the food system, but what may be much more of an issue is the impact of the environment on the food system. So if you're a decision maker in an African country, you would want to know whether your subsistence farmers are likely to be affected by climate change, whether the crops that they're growing now will be resilient to climate change, and whether climate change or changing pollinators or whatever will affect the availability or the quantity or quality of food in, in decades to come. That would be, so that's the other dimension of sustainability which is kind of omitted from the systematic review that we presented, but it's a really important dimension and I think needs to be incorporated in any, in any metric. So it's that vulnerability of the, diet, the current diet to environmental change, how quickly and how large that effect might be. Um, yeah, just a comment. So I think the, based on what Alan said, the model we're trying to propose of having this kind of more comprehensive idea of sustainability other than just environmental impacts, but bringing in health impacts, economic impacts. Um, so, so because you would have differential effects at different regions, say in low income countries or for undernourished people, you can use this regionally and in different areas. So for example, if you're trying to assess the sustainability of a proposal to eat um, less meat, for some people, I mean, it might score high on an environmental domain, but it might score low on the health domain. So then it kind of does bring in those different regional contextual issues, and it might score low on an affordability domain as well. So, I think it's probably a signal to move the discussion on to the other dimensions of this um, sustainability matrix, if we can call it that. If I can just reflect one or two of the points being made uh, by the participants in the webinar, I think they're, they're consistent with what we've discussed. Um, one is about food composition metrics. Um, uh, well, pesticides, loading, nitrogen and phosphorus, I think we've discussed to some extent. Somebody's made the point that um, in the United States, fracking is a major issue, which is impacting on water quality. And I think the metric there would be probably water quality and quantity rather than the fracking itself. Um, and then um, the use of fertilizers, which we, we've discussed, are much, the need for much more to drive much more efficient use of fertilizers because they are the major cause of um, nitrogen loading in many, in many parts of the world. And so we agree with that. Then there's an important issue about biofuel production. Um, and uh, to what extent, and I suppose this might be measured by the kind of land use, the uses to which land is put um, in terms of a metric. But certainly, um, in some parts of the world, and for some biofuels, there is competition with food. Um, and that's something we didn't discuss much yesterday, but perhaps we should reflect on that this afternoon, and maybe whether one would have a specific metric around biofuels or the kind of non-food uses of land, uh, I don't know, but it's something we should certainly um, consider. Uh, and then there was a comment that um, from Terry Ballard, FAO, that um, Dietary diversity is not sensitive enough to understand dietary patterns, and I think that's 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 correct. I, mean, I don't think we were necessarily proposing that, but we're aware that some people are using that quite um, quite widely. So uh, I think that was why it was put up, just for um, for completeness. But yes, uh, so uh, she, she says that that will be fertile ground for development of more sensitive dietary quality assessment metrics, which I'm sure we we would we would agree with. So um, let's move on then to the kind of health dimension of um, the, the metrics. Um, and we discussed in very briefly uh, several um, uh, metrics that are relevant. We talked about undernutrition, stunting, which we accept as a final common pathway for a whole range of things. On the other hand, it is a kind of, it does give you an indication of how, well, whilst you may not be able to say what's causing the improvements in stunting or de declines or, or worsening of stunting, uh, it is an overall indicator that you've got an unsustainable local um, economy, if you like. So, uh, and of course that will be widely measured as part of the SDGs, and that's another thing actually that I'll perhaps come back to at the end, but the importance of ensuring that whatever's being proposed is consistent with some of these big international uh, monitoring um, initiatives like the SDGs itself. 
So the other, of course, um, is around um, non-communicable diseases, non-communicable disease uh, death rates, because they are impacted on by a number of these environmental changes. Pollinator loss, for example, because of declines in fruit and vegetable, nuts and seeds, um, important uh, links there with non-communicable diseases. Do you want to say anything more about the kind of health measures that we, we talked about, the using disability-adjusted life years as a kind of uh, metric for looking at the health benefits of so-called sustainable diets? Do you want to add anything more, Edward? Um, Edward Joy here. I think uh, one of the observations we made yesterday is that actually the health uh, metrics are quite well defined. A lot of them are quite well quantified. And in fact, a lot of people are measured around the world for the health, healthiness of their diet or some metric that captures uh, some aspect of their, the healthiness of their diet. So um, I guess what I'm saying here is that we can almost learn from the experiences of, of developing those metrics. Um, how the, the methods that are used to quantify those metrics to move into some of the other domains where we're now saying that a healthy diet isn't enough. A healthy diet from an individual's perspective isn't enough. We've got to think about, uh, <coughs> excuse me, we've got to think about the effect of those diets potentially on the health of future generations and that important aspect of sustainability. Um, so that's not to say that the health metrics are fine. It's not to say that we know everything about nutrition. It's not to say that it's ideal by any um, uh, by any, uh, in any respect, but perhaps it's more developed than the other fields. Yeah, I mean the actual availability of dietary data at the um, dietary intake data at the national level is pretty limited, though in many countries, and as, as we found out, countries like India and so on. So, yes, there are available methods. All of them, relatively, um, got their own defects, but the availability in many countries still don't have those kind of dietary surveys. Uh, Jenny, do you want to comment on that? Yeah. Uh, it's Jenny McDermott again. It was one of the discussions we had yesterday um, about whether this domain should be called health or nutrition, because is the outcome health? So we can talk about stunting, we can talk about obesity, we can talk about various health and diseases related to nutrition, but they've got other factors that are driving them as well. And so should we really be, if we're talking about a healthy, sustainable diet here, do we need to think about, in the first instance, nutrients? And so we look about nutrient deficiencies, which will have outcomes. We know that that sort of data isn't available everywhere. But we, within the working group, we sort of talked about whether or not this domain should be nutrition or should it be health, because health has other aspects that then you'd have to sort of take into account. So, Obesity have got other issues around exercise, etc., or other diseases around smoking. So having health as one of the matrix may be slightly more complex um, an issue. Yeah, I think it depends on whether one's trying to make um, attributions uh, at the kind of national level, if you like, um, whether one's using it for research, this kind of data for research purposes. For example, for modelling the impact of a certain environmental change on health, in which case it would be, uh, it might be relevant to use health data. Okay, are there any other um, comments about the health nutrition metrics, Lucas? Um, so maybe just another way of framing this health and nutrition angle is a comment that Jenny Dermot actually made yesterday. Um, so if you if you take uh, climate change, for example. Really, the outcome is global warming and land surface temperatures, ocean temperatures. Um, but we don't measure the outcomes of changes in diets through measuring land surface temperatures. We measure emissions, and we take it as a given that if you control emissions, you'll control global temperatures. Uh, so maybe similarly, <clears throat> if we take that same approach to health and nutrition, if we measure nutritional guidelines and recommendations that are already in place, um, so, for example, percent of intake from saturated fats, uh, calorie uh, restrictions or limitations, then it's almost as a given that that will control uh, kind of the broader outcomes like obesity and scenting. Um, so kind of something we're discussing but it hasn't yeah. fully been. I mean, I think it's useful to record um, whether guidelines are available, but of course we know that really developing guidelines has very little effect on behavior. So whilst it's great that a country like Brazil has developed, say, sustainable diet guidelines, which I fully applaud, there's a big gap between those guidelines and actually changing um, 
pub the behavior of the public, the population. So I would caution uh, against using the presence of guidelines as a kind of very hard metric. I mean, I think it's useful, necessary, but not sufficient uh, to get behavior change. And that's a much more complex um, arena, I think, to actually change behavior. So that's where we need to come back to the kind of dietary surveys to know what actually people are eating. And I suppose uh, an important uh, recommendation might be that we do need to, the countries do need to invest a little in collecting some of this dietary data. Um, that may be a kind of an outcome of the of the um, group's recommendations. So we've got about 20 less than 20 minutes left. So I think what we might do is to move on to some of the other domains which get. Um, are very, very important, but also I think many of us accept are not within areas of expertise. So, for example, the socio-economic, uh, for example, employment, to what extent in employment in the agricultural sector should be included or not. And one could argue that, you know, um, employment, high employment in the agricultural sector could be good or bad, depending on what your overall economic policy was. If you, were, if you had jobs, productive jobs for people in other sectors, then having small numbers of people in the agricultural sector is not a bad thing. But if you don't, then it could be a bad thing. Uh, so one, it, it's a kind of nuanced message, I think. Um, so comments, can you just remind us again, the, in terms of the economic and social uh, metrics that we were discussing, uh, do you want to just say anything about that? We talked about, um, I think, affordability of diet, for example. Um, Tara, I know you had some views on that. Do you want to sort of say anything about affordability? Um, well, I think before saying something about that, I, think I just want to uh, make the general point that was also discussed, which was that the indicator itself doesn't tell you whether something is good or bad. Mm. It's it's the it's the value judgment you make about the number you get that drives the policy action. So if you give us an example, um, the, the affordability of food, from one perspective, yes, food should of course be affordable. Maybe it should be cheap so that everybody can have it. But at the same time, if food is very expensive, it means you have less to spend on other things which may also have environmental impacts. So it's that kind of balance of what is a fair price for food that reflects multiple different criteria. So I think when thinking about indicators, what we choose to measure itself is a kind of normative, it, it's based on a judgment about what we think is important or what we think we could do something as a result of about. Um, and so all, you know, this idea of unknown unknowns or whatever it might be, that we have to think in mind about what we might consider to be important in the future that isn't currently within the kind of dominant way of thinking about these things. And I think that's the struggle that we particularly had with the, the economic and the, the sort of socio-cultural dimensions of sustainability, because it's easy to tick the sort of GDP box or the jobs box or whatever it might be. But we also need to think about other framings of what we mean by economic development or what our goals are for a society and how you capture that when they're lots of different views about it and then not a lot of, uh, not very many developed metrics and certainly not the data that you can populate metrics with, I think you're, you're left with a whole range of kind of shifting variables that, that meant that we had a very incoherent argument that I think we need a lot more help with. Yeah, absolutely, and I think you know so we did, we discussed, for example, a portion of household income spent on food. And I think you pointed out, Tara, well, maybe in some developed countries, spending too little on food. Uh, in other countries, people are spending too high a proportion. But the important thing is whether we should, you know, whether that sort of data, that metric, should be um, made more valid, widely available, and should be considered um, as part of this assessment. Did you want to? Just one more uh, comment on this. Hi, um, I'm Lauren Blake. I'm from the If Style program in Elsira. Um, my background's in anthropology, so um, I, and I'm very glad, obviously, to see that the kind of sociocultural is one of the four boxes, but it hasn't had much attention. You're saying that you're kind of wanting some help with that. So I'm just kind of wondering what you um, 
what you've kind of your knowledge is on that so far. Like, uh, are there gaps because you haven't found the literature, or is it just that you don't know where to find it? You think it is there, but you haven't looked at it, or you know, what's your kind of knowledge on that at the moment? And also, um, what are your kind of plans for using in particular qualitative data? Most of you know, well, pretty much everything so far has been quantitative, and so I was just wondering what your kind of plans are for using qualitative. Uh, data, which is, I think, very valuable in the sociocultural side of things. So, yeah, it was kind of more of a question, really, but, um, yeah, to kind of see where you're heading with that. And sorry, one very quick comment. You were talking about conceptual frameworks earlier. Um, just an idea, I'm no expert on it at all, but the true cost accounting, I know that's one that some people are using. I'm not an expert on it, but it's quite a holistic way of looking at things, so it might be worth looking into. Yeah, that's a good point. Thank you, Lauren. This is Edward Joy again. Um, so I'm just going to pick up your point there about qualitative data. How, how do we use that? Can we put it alongside, can we use it alongside the quantitative data, which is perhaps easier for us as researchers to, to use in models and so on. Um, I think this is a very important point, and I tried to touch on it in the presentation, about uh, diets that are proposed, and they're suggested to be great for the economy, great for health, great for the physical environment, but unrealistic. So one of the things I think we need to do is build this into our methodologies and not just come up with a number and say, this is sustainable, this is not. But we need to come to that number while recognizing some of these qualitative issues such as acceptability of diets. And so I think one of the methodologies we could use, for example, is to minimize deviation from a current pattern. So we might say that if we want to optimize a diet, what we actually want to do is, is reach these targets um, in terms of uh, reduction in, in impacts on the environment while maintaining health, for example. But we want to minimize this, the optimized diets, uh, deviation from the current pattern. And so that's a way of building into the methodology, uh, perhaps a way that we're not going to propose a diet that's completely outlandish, <coughs> excuse me, completely outlandish, completely unacceptable. Um, and I think there are a number of ways that we can do that, and that's just one example. Um, but I think another way we could do uh, this is look at diets that people are already consuming um, and look at the variation, the current variation within populations and say that actually these are acceptable to a lot of people in this in this context. Could we move, move more people away from some of their patterns into another pattern that's already present within the population? So I think what I'm trying to say here is that it might be a, a methods question rather than a metrics question um, when we're trying to talk about something like cultural acceptability. Good. Uh, I think it is true to say though, that the group hasn't, uh, unlike um, the Lucas's systematic review of the environmental um, impacts of diets, that there hasn't been a systematic review of the kind of cultural, economic aspects of sustainability or the literature on, on metrics related to that. So that is, if you like, a, a deficiency which which maybe could be remedied, or maybe we pass it, the group passed that on to other people to do that work. I don't know. Uh, Do you want to come in, Lucas? Yeah, I just wanted to provide some examples of some of the um, kind of items we were talking about yesterday, just to put us on the same page. So in terms of the social, cultural, ethical uh, kind of indicators or outcomes, we're looking at examples such as um, what Edward mentioned about, you know, is this proposed diet, would it be culturally acceptable? So, I mean, if, if it's very far from what people currently eat and we're asking them to eat something uh, completely different, then that's probably not, not sustainable. Um, Route. Um, also looking at more kind of <clears throat> ethical issues, um, would a proposed diet that has uh, a large increase in meat, um, would it have any uh, animal welfare issues? Um, or for example, if we're uh, proposing more intake of seafood, uh, if that comes say from uh, a Thai prawn industry that uses slave labor, um, would it have any kind of human rights implications on that? Um, trying to think if there's anything else. But yeah, basically just some examples to for the group to tell us if we're completely off track or maybe just to build on these as well. I think, again, I, I would suggest that we also need to look more carefully at the SDGs and the indicators for the Sustainable Development Goals, which will be agreed by the middle of the year. And some of those are around issues like productive employment and so on and, and human rights issues. So rather than going off 
as, as the group by itself, you know, try to integrate with the uh, broader international framework which has been uh, agreed. Uh, so, do we have any other comments coming up from the people on the webinar? Yeah, we have someone who would like to try it audio. So ah, okay, I'm good. From the FAO, so. Oh, great, great. So, um, shall we, we're going to try an audio uh, question now, just um, or at least a comment, maybe. So just give us a moment. <laughs> <laughs> Lawrence, if you can hear us, uh, let's try to take your question. Let's try to open the audio. Perhaps in writing. Oh. <laughs> we tried to get the mic to work, it didn't, but if, did you want me to read out the question, Sarah? Or comment? I think it was more like an extended comment about what other initiatives we have. Ah, so okay. Well, that's really useful. I mean, from our colleague in, writing, yeah. in FAO, if, if you could send us that in writing, we will then you know, circulate it after this meeting. That would be a very useful comment, I think, to include in our uh, deliberations. Some of the other issues that came up um, in the discussion of the group, which were uh, not entirely resolved, but were discussed briefly yesterday. One was around trade. Uh, because obviously um, trade, again, can be positive or negative in terms of sustainability. Um, and um, whether there are indicators of food trade which can be or should be incorporated, I think is one that we didn't fully uh, you know, decide. But it's certainly a very important issue. Um, and of course trade can provide a way for populations who may not be able to grow food sustainably within their own national boundaries to capitalize on, on the world uh, flows of, uh, of food, but that does have certain risks attached to it. And one can see, for example, uh, when Russia stopped exporting uh, in 2010 uh, because its wheat harvest failed, wheat production went down by 30% and they stopped exporting. And that caused, in some countries anyway, an increase in, in prices of bread and so on, probably contributed to political instability. So. Trade is good if it's resilient and if it um, if it's, uh, can maintain flows in difficult times, but on the other hand it can also increase vulnerability. And of course many um, poor, very poor people uh, do not have access to world markets, so for them the, the challenges are, are very different and they depend much more on local ecosystems and so on. So, um, capturing those kind of nuances of people who don't have access to markets and what are their key issues for them, um, and then people who do have access to markets, um, and to how, how resilient are those trade flows to environmental change and environmental shocks, seems to us important, but we don't have simple answers about how one would develop a metric uh, for that. And likewise, we also discussed whether, we should, whether or not we should include within this framework the, some of the drivers um, which are driving us in the wrong direction towards unsustainable diets. So for example, subsidies or taxes would be obvious examples of those. Um, and I think the discussion we had yesterday is that probably that's something that this group wouldn't tackle, but would acknowledge that it's very important to understand what the driving forces are. And if there are major subsidies in the system, like in the EU for example, who are subsidizing um, practices that may be ultimately environmentally damaging, that's very important to understand. But I think I think the decision of the group was probably that, because of the complexity already, one probably wouldn't get into the uh, metrics in, uh, of the drivers of environmental change or, or food system or diet related environmental change. Tara, did you want to comment on that? Yes, and I, I also think there's a there's a danger between um, confusing what the indicator is and what the prescribed approach that you're trying to. So, so if you take something like level of subsidies uh, within a system, um, again, you have to think about whether you're actually implicitly saying that subsidies per se are bad. Or whether you know they may they may or may not be bad. It depends on what they're used for. It depends on what your sort of economic uh, 
model, whether you take a more free trade approach, whether you, you, you believe that there's a stronger role for regulation and so forth. And I think if we're getting into metrics, we're, we're not trying to direct the route towards achieving a sustainable diet. We're trying to, to set out what the indicators are, and then a policymaker can make a choice based on their political, political approach as to how to achieve that goal. Yeah, I think that's an important point. Yeah, thank you. Well, look, we're getting towards the end. We need to draw things to um, a close um, very soon. Can you hear me? Ah, oh. good. Yes. Yeah, that's I much better. Who are you and where have you come from? I'm very sorry. My name is Florence Egal. I am indeed a retiree from FAO. And I joined this uh, webinar because I'm extremely interested in sustainable diets. And many of us are engaged in this. But we never had contact with the London School until now. Um, and I did share uh, with, I suppose it's Anna, that was uh, a certain number of references. And I believe um, that there would be a lot of interesting opportunities uh, to link with the people that are now working on food systems. Um, in the food and agriculture world since 2013, there's a lot of interest on getting food systems that are sustainable and can deliver in particular on health outcomes. And from the health side, uh, people working, for example, in WHO, Kobe urban health centers and so on are starting to say they won't be able to deal with non-communicable diseases if they don't start looking at food systems. So with the organization this year of Habitat 3 in Quito, and of course the SDG last year, there is really a window of opportunity to try and link the food and health agenda. And a lot of people now are working on indicators uh, for food systems, for territorial systems, for urban food systems, etc. And I was just thinking it may I, I would be very happy to try and link you to some of these uh, initiatives if you're not already linked. Thank you very, very much indeed. I think it's really useful comments, and I'm sure I see people nodding around the table. I'm sure there'll be a lot of interest in making those links. Maybe we can follow up uh, by email or by call after this meeting to ensure that the group is linked in to the people that you suggest. I'd be very, very happy to do that. I also mentioned that I'm probably going to be in a meeting in London on 25th of uh, February. And if that could be of any help, I could swing by the school and have a quick chat of whoever would be interested. One of the points I'm mentioning in my comments is there on last October, uh, there was uh, more than 100 cities that signed an urban food policy pact in which there is a whole section on health and sustainable diets. So I think there, there are many opportunities to actually link with researchers such as yourselves to start looking at what those cities are trying to do and say, guys, you may want to make informed decisions or at least monitor what you're doing in a prop in an appropriate way. And Great. London well, has that's marvelous. And I'm sure that the group would be very interested in making uh, links with that with that group. And, and indeed, that might be um, a group of policymakers that could could make use of some of these metrics. So that's very, very helpful indeed. And we'll get back to you about the 25th um, of okay. February. Thank you. So we need to draw things to a close now. Um, I think we're really grateful to everyone for their comments. And I know quite a lot have come in in writing. And so I know that the group will do its best to respond to those uh, comments and requests for more information and so on. And um, there might be an opportunity also to comment as this document the draft emerges and, and becomes more um, appropriate to circulate. Uh, there might be perhaps some sort of open consultation which will allow people to express their views on the, perhaps a, a subsequent draft of the, of the document. Uh, so that's something we, we would certainly consider. Are there any other final comments that anyone uh, wishes to make at this stage? Uh, you will invite everyone to, uh, you'll let them know about the Ethiopian conference. Yeah, so we'll, we'll send uh, an email around about the details for registration for the conference in Addis Ababa in June and any other events that might be relevant. Uh, 
but can I just um, sign off by thanking you all for your contribution. It's been a very good, very lively, active debate. I think it's given the group, I'm sure, a lot of food for thought. Um, and I think the, we are dealing with some very, very difficult issues here. Um, but uh, this has been a very important step, I think, in helping to bring some of this work to the next stage and hopefully to fruition. So thank you all very much indeed for your contributions.